right, so today we go into part three. Part three, I hope this has been a blessing of the search for the doctrine of grace. All right, the search for the doctrine of grace. And um, I've already gotten a lot of really good feedback from this teaching, so people are really appreciating that we're trying to cover some of the terms that have become I like to call it Christianese. In other words, once Christianity has embraced a particular term, they've kind of turned it into something that's not exactly what it originally was, and so it no longer has the meaning, the value, the usefulness that the word would have. So that word grace becomes really a challenging word because you know, most people don't understand what grace really is according to the scriptures. So we did talk about the fact that there are 200 plus verses, 220 something verses with the word grace in it. 60, um, 69 of them in the Tanakh and 156 of them in the Brit Kaddishah in the New Testament. And so what we decided to do was we decided that we would read all of them. So that there could be no argument that we missed somehow the one key verse that unlocks whatever it is somebody wants grace to be. And we're trying to see what is grace really? Is there such a thing as a doctrine of grace? Where does that come from? Why would anybody believe in such a thing? Because quite frankly, we've talked about this every week, but just so it's on this teaching, if you turn on the TV tomorrow and listen to any teachings tomorrow on Sunday, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear grace. You're going to hear the doctrine of grace. We're under grace. We're not under the law. It's grace, grace, grace. And I, I, you know, nobody knows what it is. They don't understand. So what we've been talking about is, is grace. We've already covered um, a good chunk of the Tanakh. We might actually um, finish that today and get a little bit into the Brit. We'll have to see how this works. But also, just so we understand as we're going through this, every single verse that we've read up to this point has had the following phrase built into it. Finding favor in the eyes of if I have found favor in your eyes, if I've not found favor in your eyes, now I know I have found favor in your eyes. It's all about finding favor in the eyes of. And what did we come to figure out? We came to figure out that that's something that's merited. And what does the church teach? That grace is unmerited favor. And what do we find out from the Tanakh so far? It's merited favor. What is unmerited? I don't know, mercy? Could the church be confusing mercy with grace? Because you don't have to earn mercy. I give you mercy just because I care about you, because I love you, for whatever my, for whatever my reason is. <clears throat> Do you understand what I'm saying? It's my reason to give you mercy. I can choose to give you mercy or not give you mercy. But you don't necessarily have to earn that. You don't have to merit that. If you're my child, if you're my spouse, if you're my friend, I may just choose to give you mercy because you're my spouse, you're my child, you're my friend. And that, that wasn't something that you merited just because I like you. I care about you. I'm hoping that things will be better. Whatever reason I want to give. That's mercy. If I found favor in your eyes, the word favor there has the idea of, the deal of if I found approval in your eyes, if I've been find, found in good standing in your eyes, if I've merited what I'm asking, please give me what I'm asking. If in your eyes you think I deserve or earned or merited this, then please give me what I'm asking. That's what, the, that's what the word chen in the Hebrew, which means grace or favor, it's the underlying word that would be underlying the word charis, which is grace in the Brit Kaddisha. So now we're in the prophets. We started in Genesis, we went through, and now we're in the prophets. Okay, we finished through the first five books, we finished through Sa Samuel and Kings, and then we went through Jeremiah, now we're up to Nahum. Nahum, which is between Micah and Habakkuk, if that helps anybody. If you're in the 1997 scriptures, is on page 625. I don't know if that helps anybody either. But we're going to Nahum chapter 3. Like I said, it's between Micah and Habakkuk. Or some people say Habakkuk, whichever way you put the accent. Nahum chapter 3 and in verse 1. Woe to the city of blood, all of it is alive. Filled with plunder, the prey is not lacking. The sound of a whip, the sound of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of jolting chariots. Mounted horsemen in bright sword and glittering spear, and many wounded, and a mass of dead bodies, and no end of corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the many whorings of the well-favored whore, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations by her whorings and clans by her sorceries. 
See, I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts, and shall lift up your skirts over your face, and shall show nations your nakedness, and range your shame, and I shall cast abominations upon you, and treat you as foolish, and make a spectacle of you. So here we have the words in verse 4, the whorings of the well-favored whore. Well-favored whore by who? Because Yahweh says, see, I am against you. I am against you. The mistress of sorceries. See, you can be favored, but not necessarily by Yahweh. Or you can be favored of Yahweh and totally disappoint him and no longer be favored. In other words, he chose Israel, but he wasn't always fa uh, you know, happy with them. He wasn't always pleased with them. They were not always in a state of approval. They weren't always in his favor. And that's why he allowed them to suffer, be taken into captivity, and etc. But yet in his mercy, and because he favored Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and made promises to them, he brought them out of some of those things and promises to bring them out again. Restore us all at some point. But notice what he says. He says, you know, hey, because of the many whorings of the well-favored whore, the mistress of sorceries, see, I am against you. Where's the unmerited favor here? This is the same word, that verse, word, word chen. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 1. Okay, we'll read some verses here. And the messenger who was speaking to me came back and woke me up as a man is awakened from sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, now remember, sometimes we're going to read a whole bunch of section because it gives us the context and the framework of where this favor is coming in. We're not just going to just read the one verse where the word was and not understand, well, what was being talked about. Does that make sense? So here we're going to read 7 to 10 or 14 verses just to make sure we understand the one or two places where it's going to say favor. He says, what do you see? So I said, I have looked and see a lamp stand all of gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps and seven spouts to the seven lamps. And two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Then I responded and spoke to the messenger who was speaking to me, saying, What are these, my master? And the messenger who was speaking to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he answered and said to me, This is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. Yeah. Who are you, great mountain before Zerubbabel? A plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of favor, favor to it. And the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall complete it. And you shall know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small beginnings? They shall rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of Yahweh, which diligently, diligently search throughout all the earth. Then I responded and said to him, What are these two olive trees, one at the right of the lampstand and the other at its left? And I responded a second time and said to him, What are these two olive branches, which empty golden oil from themselves by, which the, by means of the two gold pipes? And he answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the master of all the earth. Now that's part of the two house teaching. That's part of the understanding about Judah and Ephraim, the two olive trees, the anointed of Yahweh, who stand beside him, or at least they're supposed to stand beside him. And they will again stand beside him, because this is prophetic, this is looking to the future. This is speaking the word of Yahweh with authority. That's what prophecy is. Speaking the word of Yahweh with authority. And in this case, it's talking about a future event. But notice the context of the word favors in verse 7. In verse 7, now, he's talking about, not by, in verse 6, he said, not by my might nor power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts, a great plain, a plain, uh, and he shall bring forth the capstone which shouts a favor. Who is the capstone? Yeshua. He's going to bring forth the capstone with shouts of what? Approved, approved. He who is in good standing, this is the approved one. The capstone, favor, favor to it. Favor, favor to who? To Yeshua. Did Yeshua merit the favor? Absolutely. He was the, he was the, the pleasing son. Remember what did Yahweh say? This is my son in whom I'm what? Well pleased. Can you be well pleased 
without merit? It doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I'm pleased with you because you do what makes me pleased. So when my child is doing something, I may say to him, look, I'm not very happy with you right now. You know, you didn't, I, I'm not pleased by what you did. Or I may say, I'm very well pleased. It is my pleasure to give you something or do something for you because I'm happy. I'm pleased with your behavior. I'm pleased with what you've done. I'm pleased with how you handled the situation. I'm pleased by something that you did. And so that's favor, favor to it. I went all the way to the end of the chapter, though, because I wanted you to catch these are key critical verses that have to do with the future, the two witnesses, the anointed ones, the, the lampstand. That is the true symbol of Yahweh. Forget about the star. Forget about the fish. Forget It's the seven-branch menorah. I'm not attacking the other things. I'm simply saying this is the one true scripturally uh, you know, um, endorsed symbol. Now, it's not endorsed as something you should be wearing, carrying around with you, or having on a chain. I'm just saying this is his symbol. So he's not telling you to go make a copy of it and put it on a wristband or put it on your shirt. or put it. I'm just saying this is his symbol. The symbol of what he's doing is a seven-branched menorah. And then he says there's these two olive trees. The two olive trees that are on either side of the menorah. And I'm telling you, those two olive trees are the two houses of Israel. That teaching is on the identity of Israel teaching. You know, we did that four-part teaching, and it explains that in part three. So you can go and listen to that. All right, let's continue in now the writings. We finished with the prophets, and let's go to the writings. We're going to go to Tehillim, to Psalm 45. Psalm 45. Tehillim, Psalm 45. And we're going to read verse 2. You are more handsome than sons of men. Favor has, poured, has been poured upon your lips. Therefore, Elohim has blessed you forever. Let's read that in other English. Approval has been poured upon your lips. Good standing has been poured upon your lips. And therefore, because of that... Elohim has blessed you forever. You see, it was merited. Now, if we want to go into Christianese, we would say, grace has been poured upon your lips. I mean, I know there are people that think before meals, they say grace. You say grace? Grace isn't something you say. You want to praise Yahweh and thank Him for the food. Say, well, praise Him and thank Him for the food. Bless Him. Do some blessings. Brachot. You say Grace. How is that? I mean, where did that come from, this idea of saying grace? <laughs> but here, it is on the lips, so maybe that's it. Grace is poured upon your lips, so it's something you say. No. Favor is found based on what comes out of your mouth. And because favor was found on this person's lips, in other words, they were saying things that were approved or that were well-pleasing to the Father, it says, therefore Elohim has blessed you forever. Does that make more sense? That it was favor was found because favor was poured upon their lips. They were saying these wonderful things, these good things, approved things of Yahweh. They were blessing, not cursing. They were uplifting, not tearing down. They were speaking truth and not lies. And so because of that, Elohim has blessed you forever. See, that makes a whole lot more sense, doesn't it? Let's continue in Psalm 84. Tehillim, Psalm 84. And we're going to begin in verse 1. And we're probably going to end up reading the entire psalm here. So let's just do that. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts! My being has long and even fainted for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living El. Can you say those words and mean it? And I don't mean just occasionally when you're really in suffering. I mean, can we not feel that way all the time? Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow nest for herself where she has put her young ones. Your altars, O Yahweh of hosts, my sovereign and my Elohim. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you, Salah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Your highways are in their heart. Passing through the valley of weeping, they make it a fountain. The teacher also covers it with blessings. They go, for, they go from strength to strength, appearing before Elohim and Sion. O oh, Yahweh, Elohim of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh, Elohim of Yaakov, Salah. O oh, Elohim, see our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. 
For a day in your courts is better than a thousand days. I have chosen rather to be a doorkeeper in the house of my Elohim than to dwell in the tents of the wrong. Now listen to where this is all leading. For Yahweh Elohim is a sun and a shield. Yahweh gives favor and esteem. He withholds no good matter from those who walk blamelessly. O oh, Yahweh of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. See, I read all that other stuff in the beginning of the chapter because he's leading us to this part. He says, Yahweh gives favor to the person who approaches him this way. And because they approach him this way, they're going to desire to walk blamelessly. Because if you're crying out to him, if you're saying, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of Elohim than to be dwelling in the, uh, you know, the abundant, uh, affluent tents of the wrong, if your whole approach is that way, you're going to walk in obedience. You're going to walk in, blameless, in a blameless state. And so what does he say? He says, look, Yahweh gives favor and esteem, and not for no reason. He withholds no good matter from those who walk blamelessly. So, favor is merited. Favor is merited. Let's go to Proverbs, Mishlei chapter 1. Mishlei chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 8. Mishlei verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. My son, heed the discipline of your father, and do not forsake the Torah of your mother, for they are a fair wreath on your head and chains about your neck. Now there the word fair wreath is a wreath of favor. Okay, the word chen is in there. They are a wreath of favor around your neck, around your head, excuse me, and chains around your neck. So he says, look, heed the discipline of your father. Do not forsake the Torah of your mother because they are going to be favor around your head. You see what brings favor? Merit through Torah obedience. Merit through, through keeping of the mitzvot. I hope that's clear. We're going to see that idea of a wreath of favor here in Proverbs a couple of times, or this idea of where it said a pleasant wreath or a fair wreath, but there the same word is the Hebrew word chen, which means favor. Let's go to Mishlei chapter 3, and in verse 1. And we're going to read pretty much this whole chapter. Mishlei chapter 3 says, My son... Do not forget my Torah and let your heart watch over my commands for length of days and long life and peace they add to you. I bet you that's not preached tomorrow in the Sunday church. He says, let not kindness and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. You see what it's, it's, it's still using the metaphor of things around your head and things around your neck. It goes back to chapter one. The things that bring favor. It's a wreath of favor. He says, write them on the tablet of your heart. Thus finding favor and good insight in the eyes of Elohim and man. Let's read that again. Do not forsake the Torah. Let your heart watch over my commands. For length of days they have, peace they add to you. Let not kindness and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Thus, because, this is the reason why, it says thus, finding favor. This is how you find favor. Sounds like merit to me. Sounds like you earn this to some degree, if you understand what I'm saying. Oh no, he's talking about earning things again. Next thing you know, he's talking about earning salvation and earning this and earning that. I'm just reading it to you. You figure it out for yourself. He says, thus finding favor and good insight in the eyes of who? Elohim and man. He says, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Know him in all your ways and he makes all your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It is healing to your navel and moistening to your bones. Esteem Yahweh with your goods. In a little while, oh, excuse me, I, I, I turned the page too fast, and with the first fruits of your increase, then your storehouses shall be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the discipline of Yahweh and do not loathe his reproof. For whom Yahweh loves, he reproves. As a father, the son whom he delights in. Blessed is the man who has found wisdom and the man who is getting understanding. So now we're seeing that Yahweh delights in those who he reproves, those he disciplines. He said, blessed is the man who has found wisdom and the man who gets understanding for the gain, now we're in verse 14, for the, for the gain from it is better than the gain from silver 
and it's increased in fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all your delights are not comparable to her. Length of days is in her right hand, riches and esteem in her left hand. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those taking hold of her, and blessed are all those who retain her. Yahweh founded the earth by wisdom. He established the heavens by understanding. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up, and the clouds dropped down dew. My son, you know what's implied here? That Yahweh knew what he was doing when he gave the commandments. Oh, but those burdensome, terrible things, that was because they were dumb and he just needed to hurt them and curse them. Really? Length of days they are. Blessings to you. They're, all of her paths are peace. What paths? The paths of Torah observance. My son, verse 21, let them not depart from your eyes. Watch over sound wisdom and discretion. Then they become life to your being and an adorning to your neck. There's the word favor again, by the way. That's the word grace again. They become an adorning or favor to your neck. So you're walking around with favor around your neck. So people go, you know, like, I don't know, Olstein loves to do this. I'm just walking in favor. Well, if you want favor around your neck, keep the commandments. Follow Yahweh, obey him, and you'll be walking with favor around your neck. Then you would walk safely in your way and your foot would not stumble. What have I always told you that Torah does? I told you it blesses you. We've read that already. And that it keeps you safe. Look what it just said. Then you would walk safely in your way. If you would just listen, you would be safe. When you lie down, you need not be afraid. And you shall lie down and your sleep shall be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden dread, nor of the ruin of the wrong when it comes. For Yahweh is at your side. Well... If you're walking in favor, he is. Yeah. If you're not, you've distanced yourself from him. Right. He's still watching you, but he's not at your side anymore. But he's watching you to see if you'll make a teshuvah, if you'll repent. Then he can come back to your side. Amen. Two cannot walk together unless they're agreed. So he's not walking by your side unless you're in agreement. Guess what? That's referring to the agreement made at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 when it says, if you agree to obey, I'll take you as my people. There's, that's how they agree. We agree with him, we obey, he blesses us. Amen. He takes us as his people. So it says, look, he says, Yahweh's at, by your side. Well, only if you're at his side. If you've turned left, he's not turning from the path. He's walking, you're walking. If you turn left, guess what? You're not on his side anymore. Yahweh's at your side, and he shall guard your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it. Wait a minute, it's talking about merit again. So you're supposed to do what he did. He doesn't withhold good from you when you deserve it. He withhold good from someone when they deserve it. When it is in your power of your hand to do so, don't withhold it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back tomorrow I give it, when you have it with you. Isn't that what James quotes? When he says, go and be, and be blessed and be fed, he says, no, I'll you know, go and do the works. He says, do not plan evil against your neighbor, seeing he dwells safely beside you. Do not strive with a man without cause. If he's done, if he's done you no evil. Do not envy a cruel man and choose none of his ways. For the perverse one is an abomination to Yahweh, and his secret counsel is with the straight. The curse of Yahweh is on the house of the wrong, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Righteousness is something you do. He blesses the home of the righteous. Now listen to this. After all of that, he says, he certainly scoffs the scoffers, but gives favor to the humble. What did he just spend 34 verses describing? A humble person. A humble person trusts in Yahweh. A humble person doesn't seek his own, seeks Yahweh's will. A humble person seeks wisdom and understanding from Yahweh, not his own wisdom and understanding. A humble person, a humble person, a humble person, guess what they get? For being humble. By the way, humble is something you do. You have to be humble. Just doesn't spontaneously just manifest itself. You have to choose to humble yourself, to submit yourself, to be humble. And guess what? He gives favor to the humble. The humble merit favor. To the wise, the wise do inherit esteem, but fools are bearing away shame. Such a powerful, powerful chapter. And the word favor comes up in there three or four times. Don't you want that around your neck or around your head as a wreath? Well, we need to merit it. Let's go to chapter 4 and in verse 1. And we're going to read this chapter. Children, listen to the discipline of a father 
and give attention to no understanding. For I gave you good instruction. Do not forsake my Torah. Does this not sound like a broken record? Yes. Because we need to hear it over and over again. Yeah, it sounds like a broken record. And guess what? It doesn't get any better as you continue through Mishlei, through Proverbs. Over and over and over, he says, don't be afraid of discipline. Don't forsake what I'm teaching you. Keep the Torah, keep the commands, listen to good instruction. He says, for I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the eyes of my mother. Then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, guard my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Now we should know from other parts of this book and other things that we did a study on that wisdom and understanding come from the fear of Yahweh. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of understanding. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. And so, is there a point to fearing Yahweh? Yes. You'll want to do what he says. Amen. So you'll want to take actions. Actions that do what? Merit favor. Merit favor. By the way, and again, I know I'm going to get in big trouble here. If you were to talk to some Jewish people, some Orthodox Jewish people especially, some Jewish people that keep the commandments. If you find Jewish teachers out there, they will talk about one of the goals is to merit the blessings and the favor of the Almighty. They're always praying that, may I merit favor, may what I do be pleasing in your sight so that I might merit the Olom Haba, the, the here to come, the age to come. They understand the idea of merit. Now, it's not work salvation. We're not talking about these whole things. You know, salvation was done out of mercy. And actually, not even out of mercy. It was done because it served his purpose. It had nothing to do with your purposes. It had nothing to do with whether or not you had sinned or not. Salvation was made available to the whole world. That's not grace. Grace is what allows you, if you merit it, to enjoy salvation. By grace, you get to have a participation in salvation. By totally an unmerited act of his own desire, I won't even call it mercy, because he desires to live with people forever, he made salvation possible. That you didn't earn. You couldn't earn. But what did Yeshua say? He says, the Son of Man gives his life for the whole world. Does the whole world get in? Is the whole world saved? No. No. Nobody thinks that. Not in any Christianity, not in any Messianic, not any Jew. Okay, nobody thinks the whole world gets in. They know people will choose not to follow, not to listen, not to obey. They'll choose the other path. They'll reject the Almighty. But yet, salvation was made possible for the whole world by one amazing act by Yeshua that made salvation possible. But it's by grace by favor that you would merit. Which is why Paul says in Philippians 2, he says, work out, merit your own salvation in fear and trembling. Amen. You see how that verse really reads? He says, work it out, merit it, do the things that are necessary that by grace, in other words, by favor, you can be found well good, you, you know, well done, you good and trustworthy servant. You can hear the words, you've been pleasing and done what brings favor. So you can stand before the judgment throne and say, Abba, Father, High Priest Yeshua, if I have found favor in your eyes, may I spend forever with you. Because ultimately that's what's going to happen. They're going to decide whether or not you found favor in their eyes. That's when grace is going to come into play. But not the grace that you taught in the church. The grace of Scripture. Grace also is what covers you when you want to get back on the path because you already came out of favor. Then you merit coming back under favor. How? You repent. You change your ways. You stop doing the things that are foolish that you shouldn't be doing. You start doing what's pleasing in his eyes. Guess what? Now you merit favor again. Grace allows you to come back on the path that leads to the kingdom. See, I've always said, it's not the church that's under grace. It's Torah-observant Israelites that are under grace. Because grace only comes into play when you merit it through favor, meaning that you are trying to be pleasing in His sight. 
But when do you need the favor? Well, you need to say, Father, if I've ever done anything that's, that's been pleasing in your sight, forgive me what I've done and let me get back on the path and allow me to be headed back towards salvation. That's grace. When you say, if I found favor in your eyes, if you're pleased with my repentance, I know I messed up, but if now you're pleased because I've repented, I've in tear, tears and sackcloth and ashes, and I'm truly sorry for what I did, I'm committing never to do it again, and I'm going to walk straight now, I'm going to do this much better, if that pleases you, would you allow me back on the path? You see how grace works out? That's true grace. And we're going to continue to see that from Scripture. Let's continue. And we're going to go now, and uh, I'm sorry, we're still reading in, in chapter 4, and I don't remember where I left off. In verse, let's see, verse 5. Okay, so now we're into verse 6. Do not leave her and let her guard you. Love her and let her watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. Isn't that interesting? And the beginning of wisdom is to get wisdom. How do you get wisdom? Fear of Yahweh. Because fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. So what he's saying here is, you want wisdom? Well, then do what you got to do to get wisdom. How do you get wisdom? Well, let's see. I get online and I watch a lot of who knows how educated people teach me a lot of who knows what. That's how I get wisdom. Really? Or I go on Facebook and listen to whoever. You know, this is not how to get wisdom. You want to get wisdom? Fear Yahweh. That's how you get wisdom. Amen. And then he says, look, and with all you're getting, get understanding. What's the beginning of understanding? The fear of Yahweh. Fear of Yahweh has one purpose, to inspire you and motivate you to do what's right in His eyes so that you can have favor. He wants to pour out His grace on you by saying, I approve of you. You're in good standing with me. He wants that more than anything. He wants to pat you on the head and say, well done. I am well pleased. He wants to say to you what He said to Yeshua, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Don't you want to hear those words? He says, this is my son, full of grace. In other words, he's filled with approval. He stays in, he's in perfect well standing with me. I'm pleased with him because he's merited it. How did he merit it? He says, everything I do is what the Father told me to do. There's not anything I say or do that's not the Father telling me and say to do it. That's very pleasing to the Father. Let's continue. Verse 8, exalt her and let her, uh, let her uplift you. She brings you esteem when you embrace her. She gives your head a fair wreath. In other words, she gives you a wreath of favor. There's that word chen again. She shields you with an adorning crown. So you want favor? What's going to get you there? Wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding is going to bring you to do what? Well, let's see. If you have wisdom and you have understanding, what's going to be affected by wisdom and understanding? Your actions. What you do is going to be affected by what you understand and the wisdom that you have. Without wisdom, you're going to make foolish decisions and you're not going to have any good understanding and you're going to mess things up. So actions come out of wisdom and understanding. He says here, Hear my son, verse 10, and accept my words and let the years of your life be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in straight paths. When you walk, your steps shall not be hindered. And if you run, you shall not stumble. Hold fast to discipline. Do not let go. Watch over her, for she is your life. Let's stop there. You know what the biggest problem that we have once we start walking this path? Is discipline. We don't like discipline when it's applied to us. And we don't like to have discipline, which means that I can't be giving into temptation all the time because I have discipline. Oh, but I want to do this so bad, and I like this, and I want this. It takes discipline to say no. Amen. And that's what he's saying. He says, look, hold fast to discipline. Don't let go. Why? Because she is your life. Without discipline, you're not going to make it. Yahweh's not going to have a forever with people that can be tempted to go in a different direction. Which is why, even in the millennium, at the end, at the very end, Hasatan is released to see if the people have discipline. And guess what? We still read that there is a bunch of people that won't have discipline. They will be tempted and they will embrace the temptation. He says, verse 14, do not enter the path of the wrong. Do not walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. 
For they do not sleep unless they have done evil, and their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. For they have eaten the bread of wrongdoing, and they drink the wine of violence. So now this he's telling you, this is what happens when you're not disciplined. You go down this path. He says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of the dawn that shines ever brighter into the perfect day. Again, the word perfect there is probably out of the root tamim. I haven't looked it up, but has the idea of a day filled with integrity. You know what the body lacks right now? Integrity. That's a huge problem within the body. Integrity. You know what integrity looks like? You're the same here and the same there and the same at home, the same in public, the same with your friends, the same with people you don't know, the same in front of the rabbi, the same in front of not. You know what I'm saying? You're the same because you have integrity. But when people see you different here and different there, there's no integrity in that. How many people have sat under pastors that are like that? Oh, they, they're one way at church. Then you go and see them somewhere else. It's a whole different story. The way of the wrong is like darkness. They do not know at, uh, at what they stumble. My son, listen to my words. My son, listen to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not... This is pleading. Let them not depart from your eyes. Guard them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the sources of life. Turn away from your, you a crooked mouth and a perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look forward and your eyelids look straight before you. Consider the path of your feet and all your ways are established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Turn away your foot from evil. Do you see how favor is being really taught here? And I'm laying this all out because eventually we're going to get to the Brit. We're almost there. A couple of more verses. We're going to finally get to the Brit. And you have to have this context to understand what's going on in the Brit Kadasha. The Brit Kadasha. Let's continue now in chapter 5 of Mishlei. We've got a couple more in Mishlei before we go to Luke. Mishlei chapter 5. We're only going to read two verses here. 18 and 19. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth, a loving deer and a pleasant doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and be captivated by her love always. That verse there, it says, a loving deer and a pleasant doe. The word pleasant there is chen. So in other words, it's saying, you know, rejoice with the wife of your youth who is a loving doe. She's a, she's a doe who's had favor. She's approved. You see? It's talking about favor and approval here. And so a loving, deer, a loving deer and a pleasant, a favored or approved doe. The wife of your youth. Go to chapter 13. We're still in Mishle in Proverbs. Chapter 13. And in verse 13, we'll read a couple of verses here. He who despises the word is destroyed, but he who fears the command is rewarded. Um, wait a minute. Hold on. He who despises the word is destroyed, but he who fears the command is rewarded. Now, are we to believe just being afraid of the command rewards you? Or he who fears the command so he does it is rewarded? So reward is earned. By the way, we read that over and over again in the Are You Saved teaching, where it said in Romans chapter 2, it says, you'll be judged according to your works, some to eternal life, and some to condemnation and wrath, depending on what you did. What you do is going to be judged. We all know, every Christian knows, you're going to be judged according to your works. They just don't want to know what works are. Because works is a four-letter, you know, work or work is a four-letter word to them. What is this works, you know? Continuing, so he says, look, he said, but he who fears the command is rewarded. The Torah of the wise is a fountain of life, turning one away from the snares of death. Good understanding gains favor... But the way of the treacherous is hard. Everyone with insight acts with knowledge, but a fool spreads folly. Are we hearing what the word is saying? Are we hearing what it's talk talking about here? The Torah of the wise is a fountain of life, turning away the snares of death. Good understanding of the Torah, of all these things, does what? It gains, earns approval. It puts you in good standing. It gains favor. With who? Yahweh, with the Almighty. Let's go to Mishle 22. Mishle 22, and we're going to be exiting the Tanakh. 
This is our last Tanakh verse. Mishlei 22 and in verse 1. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is preferable to great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. Unmerited, unearned, whatever is better than gold? No. What's better than gold is, because it says here, a good name is preferred to riches. How do you get a good name? Is a good name earned? Amen. Do you earn a good name? Yes. Yep. I mean, your actions are going to either have you have a good reputation or a bad reputation. He says, in favor, in other words, being in good standing, because you're doing the right things, that's worth more than silver and gold. Because that favor is the favor from above. Being pleasing in his sight is worth more than silver and gold. That's the most valuable thing you could have, is to be hearing the words, I'm pleased with you, my child. Well done, you good and trustworthy servant. Enter into the kingdom of the master. Come sit at my right hand. Be with the sheep and not the goats. These are all things that are merited. Now we've laid the foundation. Now we've kind of said, this is everything that the Tanakh, we've had 69 verses with the word favor in it. And now we're ready to explore the renewed covenant, the Brick Hadashah, starting in Luke chapter 1. So hopefully we're all ready now to see what the Brit has to say about grace. By the way, why are we starting in Luke? Because Matthew and Mark have nothing to say about it. Isn't that interesting just to say that? You go up to any of your Christian friends and says, I want you to teach me about grace from Matthew and Mark. It's not mentioned. Not even once. It's only mentioned in Luke eight times. It's mentioned in John two times. Okay, so out of the Gospels, it's only mentioned ten times. Now, we're going to read the ones in Luke first. And I want you to read this with me and we'll see. We're going to be reading uh, chapter 1 and verse 26. We're in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. We're going to get a couple of these done in the Brit before we have to go to uh, the last part we'll do next week. Luke chapter 1 and verse 20. So actually, it's going to go more parts because then we've got to deal with all the Paul's writings. So we're going to deal with all of these writings first by the apostles other than Paul. We're going to read Paul last because we need to have everybody else's opinion before we get to Paul. And by the way, Paul's writings would look a lot different if you read the Tanakh, then the four Gospels, then the writings of the apostles, capital A. Paul did not get a capital A, by the way. There's only 12 of those. Paul isn't one of them. So that means you would have read the apostles' writings like Yohanan, like Yaakov, like Kepha, right, Peter, John, James. Read all of their writings, then go and read Paul. And then everything should have to fit. Because you'll know what, it, what Paul should be talking about because you'll have read everybody else first. What do Christians do? They read Paul first and make everything fit into him. No wonder it's all out of balance. Am I attacking Paul? No. What does Kepha say? Kepha says, Paul's writings, which are difficult to understand, that the unstudied and unlearned and unstable twist to their own destruction. So how do you get to be learned and studied? Well, you read everything else before you get to Paul. Then you can be studied, learned. Then you can maybe understand what Paul's talking about. So let's continue here. Okay, Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. And in the sixth month, the messenger of Gabriel was sent to Elohim, by Elohim to a city called Galilee, a city, excuse me, of Galilee named Nazareth, to a maiden engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the maiden's name was Miriam. And the messenger came to her, said, Greetings, favored one. The master is with you. Blessed are you among women. Okay, so it says, Greetings, favored one. Now, by the way, as we go here, Greetings, favored one, that isn't necessarily the word grace that we're talking about. That's not the verse where we're going to get to. We're going to go further on. But here it says, greetings, favored one. So even that word there, favored one, in your Bible, is saying approved one. You're approved of Yahweh. Blessed are you among women. I, you've been approved and found in good standing for this unique, incredible task. He says, but she was greatly disturbed at his word and wondered what kind of greeting this was. And the message said to her, do not be afraid, Miriam, for you, here's where the verse is, for you have found favor with Elohim. You've been found to be approved by Elohim. You've been found in good standing with Elohim. She just wasn't randomly selected. And see, you shall conceive in your womb and you shall give birth to a son and call his name Yeshua. 
He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and Yahweh Elohim shall give him the throne of, the fa of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Yaakov forever, and there shall be no end to his reign. So he says, do not be afraid to Miriam. He says, for you have found favor. You have found approval. You have been hand-selected because you've merited this. Blessed are you among women that you, of all women, were chosen, not just randomly for no reason, for this particular amazing opportunity. Continue in chapter 2, Luke chapter 2 and verse 39. Luke chapter 2. I don't remember because I don't have it written in my verses here whether or not verse uh, 28 was, was the, the, the word charis and verse uh, 29 or just verse 29. Okay, but we're in chapter 2 now and reading verse 39. Chapter 2 and verse 39. And when they had accomplished all matters according to the Torah of Yahweh, they returned to Galilee to their city Nazareth. And when they had returned, having accomplished all of the Torah commands regarding what they were doing with their son, with their child, they returned to Nazareth. And having accomplished all, i got to keep saying that, they did everything that they were supposed to do. It says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, being filled with wisdom, and the favor of Elohim was upon him. The kid grew and became strong in spirit. Well, what was he being taught to do? Everything that needed to be accomplished according to Torah. So he grew in approval in the approval and the good standing of Elohim so that eventually he would say, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Amen? Have we seen a doctrine yet? I know we've only read a couple of verses here in the New Testament. No doctrine yet, right? He's just being well pleased and, and pleasing in the sight because of some actions. Let's go to chapter 2 still and go to verse 52. Chapter 2 and verse 52 in Luke here. Okay, so now we're going to drop down. It says here, and Yeshua increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor with Elohim and with men. Now let's go back a little bit. The father and mother are seeking after him in verse 48. In verse 49 he says, why were you seeking me? Did you not know that I had to be in the matters of my father? Hmm. He was doing what his father wanted him to do. And by the way, that increased wisdom and favor to him. You see how that works out. Chapter 4 of Luke, in verse 22. And all were, being, excuse me, all were bearing witness to him and marveled at the pleasant words that came out of his mouth. And they said, is this not the son of Yosef? So all the people are amazed because Yeshua stood up and he began to say, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, has been filled in your hearing. They were, all, uh, 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 were bearing witness to him and marveling at the grace of words that came out of his mouth. The word pleasant there is charis, is grace. So they're amazed at the favored word, the words of approval, of the words of, of, of uh, good standing that were coming out of his mouth. Here it says pleasant words. Pleasant words. Let's continue in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. By the way, up to this point... Have we seen anything that says we're now under grace? No. Have we heard Yeshua say anything about grace yet? No. We're going to read the only place that Yeshua mentions grace at all in chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 27. Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. This is the only times that Yeshua is going to mention the word grace. is in chapter 6 and then chapter 17 of Luke. Yeshua speaks of it zero other times. So we've got to pay attention now. This is it. This is the one time, that, or one of the two times, Yeshua is going to mention grace. Chapter 6, verse 27. But I say to you who are hearing, love your enemies, do good to those hating you. Those are actions. Bless those cursing you and pray for those insulting you. Those are actions. And to him who hits you on the one cheek, offer the other one also. That's an action. And from him who takes away your outer garment, do not withhold the inner garment. That's an action. And give to everyone who asks you. That's an action. And from him who takes away what is yours, do not ask it back. That's an action. And as, uh, as you wish men to do to you, you also do to them in the same way. Those are actions. And if you love those loving you, what approval have you? There's the word grace, favor, whatever your translation says. If you love those loving you, how is that an approval? It's easy to love those loving you. He just told you to love your enemies. 
to bless those cursing. He goes, if you're just going to love only the people that love you, how does that earn you or merit favor? You see how that plays out? He's telling you exactly what the Tanakh told you. If you're just going to love those loving you, there's no merit in that. Anybody can do that. Any evil person, good person, anybody can love those loving them. He says, for sinners too, love those loving them. Look at verse 33. And if you do good to those doing good to you, what grace, what charis, what favor have you? For even sinners do that. How would you merit favor? Just because, hey, those who do good to you, you do good back to them. That earns you something? That merits something? He says, let me just see how many verses. I want to go to verse 38. He says, if you lend to those whom you expect to receive back, what favor have you there? He says, even sinners lend to sinners and receive back. How does that merit anything? How does that get you approval? He says, rather, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting none in return. And your reward will be great. And you shall be sons of the Most High. And you shall be walking in grace. He doesn't say that, but that's what he's saying. You'll merit the favor. Because he is kind to the thankless and the, uh, excuse me, to the, thankless and the wicked ones. He's kind to the thankless and the wicked ones. But he's not giving grace to them. He's kind to them. He's patient with them. In his mercy, he's going to still work with them and draw them. It doesn't get them approval to be thankless and wicked. He'll take care of them. He'll work with them. That's what he did with you. You were a miserable wretch. You tell me that all the time when I talk to you. He says, I was a disgusting, miserable wretch. If you only knew what I did in my life. But he was kind to you. He was merciful to you. That wasn't grace. Oh, he showed grace to me. No, he didn't show grace to you, so you started working this out. Then he showed grace to you by giving you more understanding and more wisdom and more focus. He was merciful for you. He was kind to you. He was compassionate to you. Do you understand? Amen. When you were in all of that. Continuing. He says, therefore, be compassionate as your father is what? Compassionate. That's the thing. He says he's kind to the thankless and wicked ones. In other words, he's being compassionate to them, so you need to be compassionate. He says, do not judge, and you shall not be judged at all. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned at all. Forgive, and you shall be given. Given, it shall be taken. Excuse me, given, it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It shall be put into your lap. For the same measure with which you measure, it shall be measured back to you. Measuring in what way? It's talking about actions here. In other words, with the same actions that you do, it's going to be actions back to you. What did he say? Judge not and you won't be judged. That's actions. He says, bless those, you know, condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgiven, you shall be forgiven. This is all actions. It's not unmerited. You merit forgiveness if you forgive. You merit not being judged if you don't judge. You merit not being condemned if you don't condemn. Guess what? If you're judging others, you merit being judged. If you condemn others, you merit being condemned. Does that not make any sense? But this is all, this is all Yeshua says about favor, but one more time. Let's go to Luke 17, and we'll finish today maybe with this. Let's read the one more time when Yeshua speaks about favor. Luke 17, and in verse 7. The verse he speaks in is verse 9, but we'll start in verse 7 for context. But who of you, having a servant plowing or shepherding, would say to him when he comes in, the, in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But would he not rather say to him, prepare somewhat for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you shall eat and drink? Here's verse 9. Now, would he grace? It says thank in a lot of your translations. It's the same word, charis, that's translated grace everywhere else. Would he grace that servant because he did what he was commanded? I think not. All right, so this, this servant who, who did what he was expected to do doesn't get grace. He says, so also you, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have done what was only our duty to do. In other words, it's not grace. It's not approval unless you go beyond what was your duty to do. He wants you to go beyond. You don't get to say there. This is where the people say uh, about work salvation. That's where you can't say, well, I did the minimum. I did all these check marks. You have to save me now. You have to deliver me. You have to have, give me the entrance to the kingdom. No, you have to go above and beyond. The instructions are the beginning. The instructions are the, the bare minimum. We've got to take that and make it into a lifestyle that blesses others, that cares for others, that provides for others. And so he's saying, look, 
Would he, would he thank that servant because he did what was commanded? Would he have grace for that servant who did what he was commanded? Now the Christian will say, well, see, works doesn't get you grace. Not if you're only doing what was expected. You have to go beyond. Then we have all the parables. And what does it say? He says, the one who took the talent and buried it, did nothing with it, and just gave it back, that's like the servant who just did what was expected. He had his taken away. But the ones who made something out of it and turned it into five and to ten, they were given a lot more, weren't they? They were given the blessing. He expects you to take what he gives you and do more with it. That brings favor. Yeah. That brings merit. That's merited. That's favor. Okay, so here we have read, so that we, you know, these are the only places that Mashiach mentions grace. Did you see a doctrine in there? Did you see anything that could even remotely look like a doctrine that says that grace versus the law or any of the other stuff? There's no doctrine in there. There's no doctrine in there. You know what? I'm going to read one more so we finish the Gospels and then we'll go into the writings of the, uh, of the Apostles. Let's go to John chapter 1. Okay, we'll finish the Gospels here with Yochanan chapter 1 and verse 14 because it's only three verses there and then we will have finished the four Gospels. This is the only places that you're reading about grace in the four Gospels. Yochanan chapter 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we saw his esteem, the esteem of an only brought forth of a father, complete in favor and truth. So, that's not a doctrine. It's saying that Yeshua was filled with approval. Does that surprise anybody? Of course not. He was complete in approval and in truth. And why was he complete in, in approval? Because he was complete in truth. You walk in completeness of truth, you'll be approved too. By the way, you don't have to do it perfectly to get approved. What I'm saying is, that's the Deuteronomy 8 too. He wants to see whether it's in your heart to seek approval. To keep the commandments and be approved. And say, Abba, Abba, am I doing good? Are you happy with me? Am I pleasing you? Isn't that what we cry out? I want to please you. I want to put a smile on your face. Continuing in verse 15, Yochanan bare witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has become before me because he was before me. And out of his completeness we all did receive favor upon favor. Out of his completeness we did receive approval upon approval. Why? For the Torah was given through Moses, and the approval and the truth came through Yeshua Messiah. Because, see, if we just did the Torah coming from Moses, that's not well done, you good and trust with It's not enough. We need approval means to go beyond just the letter. So let's, for example, say, all right, I think she's really pretty, this girl, and I'm not pointing at anybody in particular. And you know what? I would, I would just love to sleep with her. She's not my wife. I would love to be with that woman. But you know what? I didn't do it. Okay, so literally, I've not committed adultery. I mean, I literally have not done the physical act. But I flirt with her. I lust after her when I see her walk down the street. So what does Yeshua tell you? He says, you want favor and approval? In Matthew 5, he says, look, you've heard of old not to commit adultery. And I tell you, if you're lusting and doing it in your mind and in your heart, you've broken the commandment already. I'm going to take it to the next level. The level that gets approval. The level that brings merit. Oh, I haven't killed my brother. Oh, have I wanted to kill my brother? But I haven't killed him. So I've kept the commandment. I haven't murdered my brother. Oh, but you wanted to. You'd be happy if something happened to him. You've lusted and thought about it in your heart. You've been angry with him and said, Racha, and called him a fool. So Yeshua dealt with that also in Matthew chapter 5, didn't he? He's first, his very first teachings, he's teaching how to get merit, how to merit approval, how to get grace. You have to take Torah observance to the next level. So to a Christian, please tell them, he didn't make it easier, he made it harder. 
stop telling me he came to do away with the law and make it, make it somehow easier. No, he made it much more deep, much more full, much more complex. He gave us the fullness of the law. So what does it say here? It says, look, for the Torah was given through Moses, but the favor and the truth, the fullness of the truth, because remember, we go back to the beginning of verse 16. It says, out of completeness, we did receive favor upon favor. He's giving us the complete understanding of this whole Torah thing, to take it into your heart beyond. I mean, we're, we're told, okay, we have to love our neighbor. That's in Leviticus. That's also in Yeshua's words. Right? Love your neighbors yourself. But he's saying, look, I want you to love your enemy. Love my enemy? You're out of your mind. That's a whole nother level. That's a tzaddik level. That's a level we can't understand. That's a selfless level. You have to be completely selfless to love an enemy. Because an enemy can only hurt you and offend you if there's still a self there. Amen. But if you're selfless, it takes selfless love to love an enemy. And by the way, Abba has that. The Father has that. Why? Because it says when you were sinning, you were an enemy of his. You had enmity. Enmity means you were an enemy of his. And he loved you when you were his enemy. So he's not asking you to do anything he doesn't do. He's asking you to love your enemy because he can love you when you were his enemy. He wouldn't ask you to do something he didn't do. He only asked you to do what he did and what he's willing to do and what he has done. And so, continuing here in this verse that we're reading here in Yochanan, he says, and it says, so the Torah was given through Moses in favor and truth came through Mash Mashiach. That is all the verses about grace in the Gospels. In the four Gospels, those two in John and the eight in Luke. Anybody see a doctrine that you hear on Sunday listed anywhere in there? Does anything say in there you're no longer under the law, you're under grace? Does anything in there talk about being under grace? Is there even the word under grace anywhere in the four Gospels? No, he was filled with grace. He was filled with favor. He grew up and grew up and was even growing in more in wisdom and favor, into completeness of favor. And we have received favor and approval because of him. Why? Because he teaches us and leads us in the path. So that leads us into approval, into merit. Not because he did it and we don't have to. So we're not told here in verse 17 that the Torah was a waste of time, but grace and favor and truth and favor whatever, grace and truth, whatever came through Messiah, it's taking it to the next level. I don't know about all of you, but I don't know, I'm assuming a lot of you went to higher education. In other words, you spent a little bit of time in college. What did you learn in college? You learned how to take all the basics that you had all the way through high school and start applying them in, the real, in a real way. Taking them and making them into something that's tangible. Applying the math and the history, and the science, and the English, and all the things that you learned into something functional. That's what the Torah was. The Torah was elementary school through high school. Now, did you stop needing all of the reading, writing, arithmetic, and all the other stuff that you learned in high school when you got to college? No, you needed it even more. You need to know it inside out, because now you had to apply it. How do you become a doctor if you didn't learn science? How do you become an architect or an accountant if you didn't learn your math? How do you learn, you know what I'm saying? You had to know, you had to learn, you had to understand. Guess what? Yeshua brought us to college, to graduate school. So that's what it's saying here in verse 17, in my opinion. For elementary school was given to us through Moses, but now we have to take what Moses had and take it to graduate school. We don't throw it out. Could you take everything you learned up to high school and throw it out and think you could possibly understand anything in college? But that's the absurdity of this. The Torah is the foundation. Okay, so the foundation is don't commit adultery. The college level thing is don't even think about it. Don't do the things that would lead to adultery. Don't become overly familiar with a woman, not your wife, or a man, not your husband. Don't spend too much time doing those things that leads to adultery. Don't do the kinds of things that lead to murder. Don't do the kinds of things that lead to coveting your, your, your neighbor's things. Don't do the kinds of things. Don't do the kinds of things. Don't do the kinds of things. Fill in the blank with all of those things. You understand what I'm saying? Hopefully that makes some sense. Let's go before the Father. Avinu Malkinu, great, awesome creator, ruler of all things, we come before you acknowledging your awesomeness, your uniqueness, your, your authority with reverence, with fear, and with trembling. And Father, we come to you 
really, truly, openly seeking to understand grace, favor, chen, charis. And we under, want to understand what it means to merit such a thing, to, to merit approval, to merit being considered in good standing in your eyes. Great creator, we come to you seeking. Tear away anything that's of ourselves, seeking to be selfless, to put you in our hearts, to put you on the throne of our self-sovereignty, to get ourselves off and put you on the throne, to get out of the way so that we can truly receive. Because we know that the humble receive favor. The humble are those that are selfless. To be truly humble, you must be selfless. Help us to do that. We all suffer from being selfish, not selfless. And so help us to get rid of the selfish and turn it to selfless. Father, we come to you loving you and thanking you for your discipline, thanking you for chastisement, thanking you for getting our attention, for waking up, thanking you for loving us when we were enemies to you, thanking you for mercy, kindness, which we know is unmerited. We did not earn those things, but because you loved us, you gave us those things. You showed us mercy. You showed us kindness. You showed us compassion. And we understand that if you only did that for those loving you, there would be no merit in that, and we would have nothing to hope for. But you, in your mercy, you show us a path to grace. You show us a path to merit approval. You show us what you expect of us. So, Father, we come to you now blessing your name, thanking you, and crying out to you that, Abba, one day we might hear the words, well done, you good and trustful servant. Well done. You're pleasing in my sight. I approve of you. Enter into the kingdom. Come and spend eternity with me. So, Father, help us to truly understand what it means to be under grace to be walking in grace, in favor, and so that we may embrace it and do what's necessary to be in that place, to be in favor. Father, we thank you, we bless you, and we appreciate so much the opportunity to even come and talk to you. We're so humbled and overwhelmed that you would even talk to us. And so we come to you and the authority that Yeshua gives us and the authority of him who sits at your right hand and the high priest that we are looking forward to ruling over us, the, com the coming King Mashiach, Yeshua, in his name and his authority, we come to you as we ask all these things and we all say, Amen, Amen. the Amen.